Well, good morning, Emmanuel Bible Church, and welcome to the continuation of our Sunday morning worship service. I trust that you were blessed this morning with the music and the singing and the call to worship and the reading of the scripture. And I want to thank those who had a, a part in that already this morning of reading the scripture and leading us in, uh, in song and for those who made that available to us. Uh, my name is Pastor Mark Hazen, and I'm glad to be with you once again and uh, leading you into God's word. Uh, most uh, recently, we have been studying and making our way through the book of Ruth, so I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles, uh, take those out and turn to Ruth chapter 2, and if you have your Bible open to Ruth chapter 2, uh, we'll be ready and we'll be together in just a moment as we press into God's Word together. You know, as you find your place in Ruth chapter 2, let me just remind you and me of just some, uh, some basic important information. You know, here at Emmanuel Bible Church, our purpose and our passion is to bring God pleasure by believing his word and doing his will and the power that he provides us for the praise of his glory. And our vision, our vision is Jesus Christ. Uh, we are disciples of Jesus Christ, disciples who are growing in, in knowledge and faith and grace and obedience and we are committed to making disciples who go into all the world and make disciples of Jesus Christ for the advancement of his glory and for the joy of all people. And we value the sovereignty of God and the supremacy of Jesus Christ, and the sufficiency of the Holy Spirit, and the standard of God's word, and the sanctity of all people made in God's image, and the salvation and sanctification of mankind by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice and service of God's people to advance his fame in word and in deed. We have priorities. Uh, we prioritize the word of God, and the fellowship, and the ordinances, and prayer, and spiritual disciplines. And so that is who we are, and that's what we're about. And it's my privilege this morning just to, uh, to lead us all in the study, and the reading, and the, the reflection, and the meditation upon God's word. And I'm glad to do that with you this morning. You know, last Sunday morning in our message, I referenced the Old Testament prophet Elijah. Uh, Elijah shows up in the biblical text in 1 Kings chapter 17. And when he shows up in the text, uh, we're not given any of his backstory. Uh, we're not given any of his history. We're not introduced to his parents. We don't know if he has any siblings. Uh, we're not aware of his upbringing. We don't know anything about his early life. Uh, we don't even know how he became a prophet. Uh, we know nothing about him other than he just shows up. And he, he has a message from God to King Ahab that there's not going to be any more rain in, until he says so. And so Elijah just shows up in the text and he appears as a prophet of God and he begins doing God's work and God's ministry. Well, this morning we turn to Ruth chapter two and we come across another man who just appears in the text. He just arrives on the scene. His name is Boaz and he is introduced to the reader even before he is written into the story, even before he's introduced to the other characters in the story. Uh, Ruth chapter two, verse one is where I had you turn and uh, Ruth chapter two, verse one says this, now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Here, Boaz is introduced to us, the readers, even before he's introduced to Ruth, even before he's written into the rest of the story. It's though the author of the book of Ruth is saying to us, the reader, you know, ding, 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 pay attention here, here's Boaz. I'm introducing him to you now because he's gonna play an important role here in the story. Uh, pay attention to Boaz. But as he's introduced, we don't get much of his backstory. Uh, we don't have much of his history when he is introduced. But here we read in the text that he is a worthy man. He is a worthy man. Uh, that means he's a man of reputation. He's a man of renown. We'll discover as we read the text and press on into the story that he's a man of integrity and a man of good character. He's a landowner and quite possibly a wealthy landowner, a wealthy, worthy man. In his days, and for the ladies of his day, he would have been a good catch. He would have been a good man to pursue. Uh, we also read here in this verse that not only is he a worthy man, but he's of the clan of Elimelech. Uh, that means he's of the larger family group of Naomi's deceased husband, Elimelech. And he's going to play out in a big way in the story. Uh, so as we read here, he, he's from the right group. He's from the right family tree, and he's going to be a big help. Uh, we also know from the story of Ruth, uh, we know it well enough that if we jump ahead in the story, we know that Boaz is the answer to Naomi's prayer found in chapter one. Uh, Naomi prays in chapter one that Orpah and Ruth, her daughters-in-law, whose daughters-in-law who have been widowed, would find rest in the house of her husband. And we know as we read the rest of the story, we know that Boaz is going to become the husband of Ruth and the redeemer of Ruth and Naomi. So, so Boaz is the answer to Naomi's prayer. 
Now, if we remember chapter one, Naomi isn't in a good place when she's praying that prayer. If you remember her soul, as she describes herself, her soul, she is without hope because of her bitter experiences. But she prays to God and God is still attentive to her and God is going to answer her prayers in ways that she could not expect. Beyond this simple introduction, we're not given much of Boaz's history, much of his backstory. It's not revealed here in the text, but if we press on in the scripture, uh, there are other things in the Bible that we're gonna learn concerning his history, uh, things that are significant, significant to his life and significant to the story. It's not revealed right here in the text, but as we press on in the scripture, there's more about Boaz's backstory that I believe provides much color and dimension and depth to the story. As we press on in our Bible and if we turn to Matthew chapter one, which we're not going to do this morning, uh, we discover that Boaz has a father and Boaz's father is named uh, Salmon. Uh, We don't know much about Salmon, but we also know that Boaz, not only does he have a father named Salmon, but Boaz has a mother, a mother named Rahab. And we know an awful lot from the Bible about Rahab. You know, parents have a significant influence upon their children, and Rahab is one of those significant Bible characters. Uh, We find her written in the pages of history and throughout the Bible in both the Old Testament, and her testimony is again repeated and given to us in the New Testament. We actually read about Rahab, Boaz's mother, in the book of Joshua, Matthew, Hebrew, and James. And as a Bible character, she receives a lot of attention, and for good reason. Rahab is a renowned Bible character and she's known in the Old Testament and in the New Testament for her faith, for her faith in God and what that meant for her and what that meant for others. Rahab, her life was significant and she was influential and Rahab is Boaz's mother and she's about to become Ruth's mother-in-law. She is a remarkable woman of faith. So what do we know about Rahab? What do we know about her? We know that she's Boaz's mother, but, but what do we know about her? Think with me for a moment as we reflect upon her life and the things that we gain from her and our understanding of her and as it impacts this story. Uh, what do we know about Rahab? First, when we read about Rahab in the Bible, uh, we first encounter her in Joshua chapter two and we discover that she's living among a condemned people. She and her people are under God's condemnation. She's a Canaanite. She's an inhabitant and a citizen of the city of Jericho. Now, if we went back and read our history, we would know that God has been patiently wooing and working with her people for centuries. But they have persisted in their rebellion against him. And their time of judgment has come. They are going to perish. Her and her people are about to be destroyed. Now, when we read about God's judgments in the Bible, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, sometimes we discover that God sends a flood, like he did in Genesis chapter six and and destroys the population of the earth. Sometimes he sends a flood, sometimes he sends a fire, uh, like he did on Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, Sometimes God in judgment will send a famine or pestilence or a plague. Sometimes he sends people, another nation, who become oppressors or even annihilators. When we read about Israel taking possession of the promised land, uh, we read that God uses the people of Israel as his instrument of judgment against a people who have persisted in the rebellion against him for centuries. As the Israelites come toward the promised land and then come into the promised land, God directs Israel on what to do and how to act toward the people whom they encounter. Some of the people they are not to harass. Uh, For some of the people that they will encounter, God says, just pass through their land, leave them alone, I'm still working with them, and they don't harass or molest them or bother them at all. But then there are other people whom they will encounter and people who they will uh, come into uh, their experience as they come into the promised land, and and God's gonna say, the time of their judgment has come. Wipe them out completely, like a flood. Uh, When we read about God's judgments in history, and in the Bible, about judgments that have come and judgments that are coming, as we understand God's judgments, we come to know that they are righteous and just and perfect and they are earned. God's judgments are not random or arbitrary or capricious. They are announced and they are known and they are deserved. 
and they follow long periods of grace and patience. God sometimes uses people as his instrument of judgment toward other people. Uh, Just like as God uses Israel as they come into the promised land as his instrument of judgment against the citizens of Jericho and the the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and those various peoples they encounter, uh, just like God used Israel as instruments of judgment against other people, there will come a time in Israel's history where the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar will be used as God's instrument of judgment against the Israelites. God has manifold ways of working with people and judging the people who are under his condemnation. Rahab was among a people who were condemned to perish. She's a Canaanite, an inhabitant of Jericho, and her people are about to be annihilated. Uh, We also know from her history that when the Israelite spies came into the land to check out their territory, uh, before they took possession of the land, and before her and her people are completely destroyed, she protects and hides the spies. She protects and hides the spies, and she professes her faith in God. And as she protects and hides the spies and professes her faith in God, this is actually what she says. She says this to the Israelite spies, I know that the Lord has given you the land. I know this. I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. That's 40-year-old history. That's a long time back. And she's saying, we know, we've, we've heard what the Lord did when you came out of Egypt and how he dried up the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. That's more recent history. So Rahab, in speaking to the spies, she says, we know what God has done among you, historically and in the last two weeks, just recently. She goes on to say, as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. Rahab, Rahab was among a people who were condemned to perish. Uh, We know from reading her history in Joshua chapter two through six that when Jericho is destroyed, destroyed by God and by Israel, they both played a role in that judgment. Uh, uh, Before Jericho is destroyed, Rahab and her family are spared from destruction. Saved from perishing. Uh, She came out from under God's condemnation. Uh, She is spared the judgment that her and her people were under. How does that happen? Well, we know from Rahab's story, Rahab believes God, confesses God, and by faith in God is joined to God and to God's people. This is huge. Uh, The author of the book of Hebrews also speaks about Rahab and her faith, and this this, this is what his testimony of her is. He says this, by faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient. A Rahab is a renowned figure of faith found in the history of the Bible and her testimony is repeated throughout the New Testament in Hebrews and in James. A Rahab is a renowned figure of faith. She was an outsider. She was not a part of the covenant people. She was an outsider. She was a foreigner. She was a woman who was under condemnation and about to experience God's judgment like the rest of her people. But she turns to God and believes in God and expresses her faith in God, and by God, God's grace, she is saved, her and her family. Uh, we also know, as we read our Bibles from Matthew chapter one, that Rahab becomes the wife of Salmon. After she is rescued, she becomes associated with God's people, and, and she becomes the wife of Salmon, and Salmon and Rahab have a son whom they named Boaz. You know, we don't know much about Boaz's backstory, when he's introduced in Ruth chapter two, verse one, when he's introduced, we, we don't have much of his history. He just seems to appear on the pages of the text, much like Elijah did. But with a little study, a little research, we come to know that Boaz has a godly mother, a woman who was an outsider, under condemnation, outside of the covenants, but one who believed God and is brought into God's story and is brought into what God is doing. 
this is significant. Boaz has a mom, Rahab, who has a backstory that is going to be very similar to the woman, Ruth, whom Boaz is going to meet and marry. You need to think that through. Uh, Boaz has a mom, Rahab, who has a history and a backstory that is very similar to the woman, Ruth, that he is going to meet and marry in this book of Ruth. Boaz's mom is the right mom for him, and she's going to be the right mother-in-law for Ruth. God's providence is awesome. Now keep thinking with me, because this story keeps getting deeper and wider. Before the Israelites took possession of the land, under the leadership of Moses, Moaz, Moses in the land of Moab, uh, Moses ends up dying in Moab, but Moses in the land of Moab repeats to the Israelites the law and the commandments before he passes and before the mantle of leadership falls onto Joshua. When Moses repeats the law and the commandments, he gives them final instructions. And one of those final commandments is included, and it includes the Moabites. This is what he says in Deuteronomy 23. No Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever, because they did not meet you with bread and water on the way. They didn't meet you with basic supplies when you came out of Egypt. But because, but, and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. So not only did they not meet you, God, uh, God did not have them destroy them like he had them destroy the inhabitants of Jericho and other nations, but God had them go by the Moabites and not destroy them. But he says, when you were going by them, they didn't come out and meet you with bread and water. They actually hired Balaam to come out and curse you. They were against you, they were against me. He goes on to say, you shall not seek their peace or their prosperity all of your days, forever. So again, notice, the Moabites were not destroyed in judgment, like Jericho and other nations. They were spared destruction. They were continued to live. But notice that in judgment, they are to be excluded from the assembly of the Lord forever. And the Israelites are not to seek their peace or, the pro- or their prosperity forever. You know, we could press further on into the Scripture And we could read that in particular, uh, the Israelites were not to marry these foreigners, for these foreigners would lead their hearts astray. And God warns them, and God tells them this. And yet we see that is exactly what happened. Uh, After the time of the judges, we read into Israel's kings, and you have uh, King Saul and King David and then King Solomon. And when you read about King Solomon's life in 1 Kings chapter 11, look at what we read. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh. Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord has said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with him, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love, and his wives turned away his heart." So here we have, from the scripture, clear instruction, clear commands from God to Israel to not seek the peace or pursue the prosperity of the Moabites, nor to enter into marriage with them. And here in this story, the story of Ruth, we have Boaz, a a worthy man, a worthy man of honor, an Israelite, marrying or going to marry a Moabite. We know the end of the story. And we think this is a wonderful story. We read the story and we're like, yay, yay, Boaz the worthy man marries the desolate widowed Moabite girl and together they have a family. Naomi is restored to joy and and Ruth has a husband and a family. We read the story and we're like, yay. How is this even possible? How, How is this even possible? Hasn't God spoken clearly? You don't marry a Moabite. They lead your heart astray after their gods. You you don't seek their peace or prosperity. So how does this happen? You know, it's quite interesting as we read the, uh, the book of Ruth, which I've encouraged you to do multiple times, as we read the first couple of chapters, it is though the, uh, the author keeps repeating himself and keep, keeps making it very clear to the readers that Ruth is from Moab. She's a Moabite. Pay attention here. We have a Moabite. 
Look back with me in the, in the text. Let's look at the opening verses of uh, Ruth chapter two. It says this. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the fields after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, the house of bread. And he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man, the supervisor who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. Uh, Ruth isn't just a Moabite. No, she's a Moabite from Moab. <laughs> let's, let's like double down on this. We don't seek their peace. We don't seek their prosperity. We certainly don't marry these. You know, if the Israelites are not to seek the peace and the prosperity of the Moabites or marry them, how is it even possible that Boaz, a worthy man, an honorable man, an Israelite, is ultimately going to marry Ruth, the Moabite? And everyone rejoices at this, even the people of Boaz's day. How is this a good thing? Well, the short answer is Ruth like Rahab, was a citizen of a condemned people, a people under God's judgment. She wasn't a Canaanite, but she was a Moabite. Uh, Ruth, like Rahab, believed God, confessed God, and by her faith she was joined to God and to God's people. You know, we could go back to Joshua chapter two and we could look at Rahab's testimony and her faith in God and her confession of faith in God. This is what Rahab said. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. We could go back in our text, just back one chapter to Ruth chapter one, and we could read Ruth's conversion. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Uh, Ruth, like Rahab, even though they were citizens of a condemned people and a people who were under God's judgment, they, they believed God and they confessed their faith in God and by faith they were joined to God. That means they're no longer foreigners. Their very identity has changed. Their story has changed. Their lives are being rewritten with a brand new start. They were born Canaanite. They were born Moabite, but they've been reborn by God's grace through faith into God's family. Uh, these two, Rahab and Ruth, they are of the faith of Abraham. And because they are of the faith of Abraham, they have become the children of Abraham. They've become the children of God. They've submitted themselves to God and joined to God's story. And that, that changes everything. Uh, we no longer see Rahab as a Canaanite. We no longer see Ruth as a Moabite. These women are now family. Children of Abraham. Children of God. No longer excluded, but now brought in. You know, we began speaking about Boaz. When Boaz is introduced into the text, we don't know much about his backstory. But Boaz has a mother, Rahab. Boaz has a mother who was a condemned outsider. She got in on the story the same way everyone else does. She believed God confess God, and by faith was joined to God. She's no longer a condemned outsider. By faith, she came into a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that she might proclaim the excellencies of him who called her out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Uh, Boaz has a mother, Rahab. Boaz is go about to gain a wife, Ruth. Uh, Ruth was a condemned outsider. Uh, she got into the story the same way everyone else does. She believed God, confessed God, and by faith was joined to God. She's no longer a condemned outsider. By faith, she came into that chosen race 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that she might proclaim the excellencies of him who called her out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Boaz has a godly, faithful mother. And his experience with Rahab as his mother makes him the best candidate in all Israel to be Ruth's husband. God's providence is awesome. Boaz is Ruth's best candidate. And God is going to providentially bring them together. How remarkable. You know, here's the message for the morning. God rescues Canaanites. And God rescues Moabites. And God brings them into his story. And he brings them into what he is doing. And we ought all to rejoice in that. For we who have believed God, we have become insiders and covenant people and family members and a people for his own possession the same way Rahab did and the same way Ruth did, by grace, through faith. Uh, We have a more clear revelation than they had. Uh, In these last days, God has spoken to us by his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and in his son, Jesus Christ, God has reconciled the world to himself through the cross. We have a more clear, accurate, full revelation than they had when they believed God and confessed their faith to, in God and joined their lives to him. You know, in Ecclesiastes chapter three, it says, God seeks what has been driven away. And in 1 Samuel chapter 14, it says, God will not take away life. He devises means so that the banished one will not remain an outcast. Oh, praise God. You know, let's consider what that says about ourselves and about our own experience. What does the Bible say about us? Uh, Consider this passage taken from Ephesians 2. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. For he, Jesus, he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And then there's one other passage I'd have you consider uh, taken from 1 Peter chapter two. It says this, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. What grace to us We've been brought into the story the same way Rahab was brought into the story. We were brought into the story the same way Ruth was brought into the story. These two women were under condemnation, but they believed God, confessed God, and by their faith were joined to God. God wrote him into, their, into his story. They've become a part of what God is doing. Uh, Boaz has been written into the story. His mother is Rahab. His wife will be Ruth. How remarkable. God's providence is incredible. Let me close in prayer. O oh, great God, you are God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Great is your mercy, great is your grace to us. Uh, you certainly devise means so that the banished ones don't remain outcast. Blessings, thank you again. By your strong arm and through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, you have brought us out from condemnation. You have saved us to yourself. You have given us a name and a hope and a home and a family and a future and inheritance, you have brought us to yourself. 
we are and will be eternally grateful. Thank you for giving us the the history of Rahab. Thank you for giving us the history of Ruth so that we might receive reflections and illustrations and testimonies of the reality of faith and of your saving grace. Thank you for receiving everyone who comes to you through Jesus Christ. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, I praise God for our time together this morning. Uh, Thank you for joining us as we uh, spend time together in God's Word. Uh, Just a quick heads up before you go. Uh, We don't normally announce birthdays, but I'm going to break the norm. Uh, Today is Pastor Matt's birthday. So you can all text blitz him with a happy birthday. And since I've included his birthday, I might as well include the other one. It's also Casey Vile's birthday. So you might wish him a happy birthday as well. Happy birthday, guys. Hey, we uh, hope you have a great day celebrating. Uh, God bless uh, all of you. We hope you have a great Sunday. And uh, we'll look forward to being together again later this week. God bless you.